the topic is stages of gingivitis now let's go in detail what is uh, before we we would talk about the stages of gingivitis let's introduce uh, what is gingiva what is the what do you mean by clinically healthy gingiva and what is chronic gingivitis now gingiva is defined as that part of the oral mucosa that covers the alveolar process of the jaws and surrounds the teeth uh, surrounds the necks of the teeth when you call it as a clinically healthy gingiva it is a term used to describe or it is a term used to describe the level of gingival health that may be attained by patients who clean their teeth in a meticulous manner and what is chronic gingivitis it is a fluctuating disease in which the inflammation persists or it resolves and normal areas become inflamed the classical phases of acute and chronic inflammation are not seen in periodontal diseases most of the time what you see in a periodontal disease would be a club of or would be a combination of your acute and your chronic uh, features of inflammation so the, basically they both coexist in periodontal diseases an accumulation of the microbial biofilm a uh, constant accumulation of microbial biofilm will start a kind of host response with the form of inflammation now this will result in the gingival inflammation and if the gingival inflammation the pathway of spread if it reaches the bone and then to the periodontal ligament it will result in your periodontal diseases so as a result of inflammation clinically the gingiva will show certain clinical signs which include your redness sponginess bleeding on probing uh, probing or just the provocation of bleeding and then changes in contour and presence of calculus and plaque but no radiographic changes of uh, bone loss which are seen if only your gingiva gingiva is inflamed and it's not reached the periodontal ligament what are the sequence of events that happen the one now if you see there are four sequence of events that happen that is your initial stage your early lesion uh, the starting with your initial lesion your early lesion your established lesion and then your advanced lesion now all these four stages of gingivitis they evolved from one to another if you are able to control the plaque scores at one particular point of time that is exactly at the level of your early lesion and the established lesion then it doesn't progress to your periodontal diseases that is your advanced stage but then once you you don't control or you don't have a meticulous control of oral hygiene measures then what happens is each stage evolves from one another and finally reaching your periodontal diseases now let's talk in detail about each stage now what happens in the first stage of gingivitis that is your initial lesion in the initial lesion you don't see any kind of a clinical manifestation just other than an increase in the gingival cravicular fluid flow therefore this stage is considered as a subclinical stage of gingivitis so what happens exactly here is there's just some vascular changes which happen due to which there is an increase in the blood flow and therefore there is increased secretion of your gingival cravicular fluid microscopically if you see the widening of small capillaries and venules there is adherence of neutrophils to the vessel walls which occurs within one week and sometimes as early as two days and just uh, two days after plaque accumulation so the leukocytes will slowly start migrating uh, they leave the capillaries and they start migrating through the walls or they just exit out of the blood vessel wall that is uh, through a process of diapodosis or migration and then they get uh, accumulated or they get they are seen more in abundance in your connective tissue your junction epithelium and your gingival sulcus then if the plaque is not controlled at this stage what happens it evolves to what is called as your early lesion which is the second stage of gingivitis in the early lesion you know i told that it is basically the involvement of your uh, from the initial to your early lesion and this occurs just within one week about one week after the beginning of plaque accumulation the clinically early lesion is the one which appears as gingivitis so whatever uh, clinical features that you see of gingivitis are starting at this stage of uh, gingivitis now it overlaps and it evolves with the initial lesion with no clear cut dividing line as such what are the clinical signs that you see in early stage these include erythema and that is because of the proliferation of capillaries and an increased formation of capillary loops and then there is bleeding on probing followed by an increased gingival uh, fluid flow is going to increase some more the number of leukocytes they reach a maximum in about 6 to 4, uh, 12 days after the onset of 
clinical gingivitis. So this stage of early lesion is called as clinical gingivitis or the clinical stage. What are the microscopic uh, features that you can see? There is leukocyte infiltration in your connective tissue, a coexisting mainly of lymphocytes of about 75% being your T lymphocytes and then presence of migrating neutrophils, your macrophages, plasma cells and your mast cells. Your junctional epithelium gets densely infiltrated with your neutrophils and then ab amount of collagen fiber destruction increases. 70% of the collagen is destroyed around the cellular infiltrate. So if you can see the picture, then this stage, if you are uh, still allowing the plaque to accumulate, then it would evolve to the next stage of gingivitis, that is your established lesion. In the established lesion, the pre uh, predominant cell type that you see here are your B lymphocytes and your plasma cells. So in your stage 1, that is your initial lesion, what are the preponderance of cells you see are your neutrophils. And then in your stage 2, that is the early lesion, the predominant cells are your T lymphocytes, whereas in stage 3, that is your... Uh, uh, established lesion what the the, the pre predominant cell type is your plasma cells and your B lymphocytes now this stage 3 occurs in conjunction with the creation of small gingival pocket which is lined by your pocket epithelium the B cells which are found are mainly predominantly they secrete the plasma cells they secrete mainly your IgG1 and the IgG3 type of immunoglobulins the chronic gingivitis occurs after your two to three weeks of plaque accumulation. The blood vessels become engorged and they get congested. Venous return is impaired and the blood flow becomes sluggish. Now, all this will result in what is called as a localized gingival anoxemia. Now, this anoxemia is the one which superimposes with that of a bluish hue of your reddened gingiva. And then further, it will lead to extravasation of your erythrocytes into the connective tissue, leading to the further breakdown of your connective tissue pigments and then hemoglobin. Then this can be seen because of this breakdown of the hemoglobin, the color appears more uh, deepened color, which is seen in a chronically inflamed gingiva. If you see the histology, the most predominant cell type would be your plasma cells and the B cells. And then the plasma cells, you also see them getting invaded into the connective tissue just below your junctional epithelium, deep into the connective tissue and also around the blood vessels and even between bundles of collagen fibers. Your junctional epithelium, what are the changes that you see? The widened intercellular spaces. And these widened intercellular spaces get filled with granular cellular debris, your lysozymes or lysosomes, uh, which are derived from your disrupted neutrophils. You know, lysosomes are enzymes, which are uh, released from your granules of neutrophils, lymphocytes and even monocytes. They develop retipex. So you have, uh, so the junctional epithelium, uh, what the changes that you see in your junctional epithelium at the stage of established gingivitis is that the intercellular spaces are widened and in these intercellular spaces you have lots of fluid which is collected and then your neutrophils are seen, lysosomes, enzymes are seen and then you have your uh, lymphocytes and even other cells of inflammatory uh, cells such as your macrophages which are seen. The de there are development of retipex within the junctional epithelium and the sulcular epithelium and therefore there is a plus apart from that there is destruction of your basal lamina and the connective tissue and then the or acid hydrolases are the ones which play a key role in causing this destruction which are released from your lysosomes. What are the changes that happen in the connective tissue? The collagen fibers are destroyed at a more greater extent than that that happened during the early lesion. And then there's disrupted plasma cells and neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes are also getting destroyed. And then there is inverse relationship that exists between your number of intact collagen fibers and the number of inflammatory cells. Collagenolytic activity is increased because of and there is because of the increased release of collagenases, which are produced by the oral bacteria and your PMNs. So your chronically inflamed gingiva has elevated levels of all these enzymes, that are your cytochrome oxidase, aminopeptidases, your esterases, glucosidases, your galactosidases, and then your alkaline phosphatases and your acid hydrolases. And then. What happens in your established lesions? If you are able to control the plaque accumulation, at least at this stage, and you are able to stable, stabilize your gingival status, then it will stop with gingivitis. If not, it will progress further to turn out to become your advanced lesion. Now, this is stage 4, that is your advanced lesion, stage 4 gingivitis, wherein there is an extension of the lesion into the alveolar bone, which characterizes the fourth stage of advanced lesion, leading to phases of periodontal breakdown. 
and in under the microscope what all do you see under the histological section if you see you find lots of fibrosis in the gingiva widespread manifestations of inflammatory and immunopathological tissue damage plasma cells continue to do, uh, dominate the connective tissue followed by neutrophils continue to dominate your gingival uh, junctional epithelium and your gingival crevice or your sulcus Gingivitis will progress to periodontitis only in individuals who are susceptible to the disease and it is not that every individual is susceptible and that never that you know always it, it, it is not that always your gingivitis has to progress to your periodontitis. So it can stop at gingivitis stage and get stabilized there if, if not in some individuals it does lead to periodontal diseases. Now, if to summarize the stages of gingivitis, if you see in the initial stage, uh, initial lesion, it occurs between two to four days of plaque accumulation where blood vessels are dilated and you have vasculitis and then and the junctional epithelium and the circular epithelium, mainly it's the predominant new, uh, neutrophils which are seen. So the predominant cells, immune cells in stage one lesion are your immune, uh, your polymorphonuclear neutrophils or the PMNs. And what happens in the collagen? There is a perivascular a breakdown of collagen. Clinical findings, you don't find any clinical finding other than an increase in the gingival cravicular flow. And then it is, a, therefore it is called as a subclinical stage of gingivitis. Then when it evolves, if you are allowing it to accumulate more, you have your early lesion, which appears between the four to seven day of plaque accumulation. There is increase in the pro, uh, vascular proliferation with vasculitis. It is uh, what the cells that are seen in the junctional epithelium are your PMNs and uh, there are retipec formation and there is atrophic areas in the sulcular and the junctional epithelium. The predominant cell type that you see in your early lesion is your lymphocytes, that is your T lymphocytes. 75% of the cells are your T lymphocytes. And then collagen, yes, there is loss of perivascular collagen. And apart from that, there is slight more uh, loss of collagen just around your inflammatory infiltrate. Apart from that, your clinical findings at this stage would be erythema and an increase in bleeding on probing and even your gingival cranicular fluid is increasing. Then it evolves into the established lesion that is between 14 to 21 days of plaque accumulation. What happens here in the capillaries is that there is an increase in vascular proliferation, there is vasculitis and then there is stasis of blood. And then in the junctional and circular epithelium, what you find is retipec formation. There is, uh, it's a more advanced form of re retipec formation and atrophy of the epithelium. Apart from that, there's neutrophils and uh, uh, cells in your um, inflammatory cells in your junctional epithelium and the circular epithelium. The predominant cell type in your established lesion would be your B lymphocytes and your plasma cells. And then the collagen, uh, what happens here is there is a, a breakdown of the connective tissue in an advanced stage in your uh, continued loss around your uh, inflammatory cells and even your uh, perivascular areas and the other areas of the connective tissue. And then the clinical findings are all the signs of clinical inflammation, that is your uh, edema uh, or your color changes, your contour changes, your size changes, texture, and uh, so on. And there is increased bleeding on probing. So all these stages. So if you're able to control your gingivitis at this particular stage, it doesn't evolve to your advanced, per advanced stage. But if you're not, then it will lead to uh, periodontal diseases. And not that all individuals who are susceptible to development of periodontal diseases, it is only that only in certain individuals individuals, gingivitis progresses to periodontitis. Thank you. The topic is defense mechanism of gingiva. Now, any tissue in the body would have certain kind of a defense against itself in order to prevent any violation of the structure, right? Similarly, your gingiva also has certain defense mechanism which keeps it in health so that it doesn't enter any disease state. Now, before, uh, for the uh, Gingiva to enter the disease state, it has to the defense mechanism has to be broken down, or the probably the pathogenic potential should be more severe when compared to the defense mechanism that is produced by the host. Now let's see in detail what is the defense mechanisms of gingiva. Now you know defense mechanism, number of mechanisms operate within the gingiva in order to keep the gingiva in integrity. Now you have two types of mechanisms, you have the specific mechanism and you have the non-specific mechanisms. The specific mechanisms include all the ones which have the memory, that is a specific antibody response either in the form of a humoral immunity or your cell mediated immunity which will help in keeping the tissues in health. And apart from that your non-specific immunity or the non-specific mechanisms include the following, that these are the bacteria 
bacterial balance, the surface integrity of the tissues, and then the surface fluid and enzymes that are released, and then phago the potential of phagocytosis, and then the inflammatory reaction. Now, all these are supposed to be the protective mechanisms or the non-specific protective mechanisms which are involved in as a as a part of defense mechanisms of the Jinjaga. Now, first, let's go in detail about each one of them. Now, what is bacterial balance? How is this bacterial balance? You know, our oral cavity has lots of bacteria, maybe around 500 species of bacteria are present in the oral cavity. In order to keep all the bacteria in balance, now there has to be a, a balance between the, the one of the normal flora and the one of the pathogenic flora. Now how the body balances itself is the beauty of the non-protective mechanism. Now you have lots of, apart, uh, just along with the uh, bacteria, you also have lots of fluids in the mouth. You have your saliva, you have your GCF, and apart from that, you have the different compositions or the different uh, ingredients within the uh, saliva and the GCF, probably the enzymes or probably certain antibacterial enzymes or maybe probably the pH of the saliva or the pH which, which, which even alters the pH, uh, the pH of your uh, tissues. So all these factors will keep your bacteria in balance within the host. Now apart from that, your surface integrity. Now the surface integrity meaning the, the structure of your either your epithelium or your uh, the, basically the structure of your tissues, be it your tooth surface or your epithelium. If your, to, if your epithelium is properly arranged without any uh, break within the epithelium, then it maintains a proper integrity and this uh, always your epithelium is constantly undergoing a renewal process. Your oral epithelium takes about 10 to 12 days for the renewal process whereas your junctional epithelium just renews itself within just a span of 5 days. So there is a constant renewal of the old epithelium to the new epithelium. So that can maintain the surface integrity of your tissues. Now, apart from that, you also have your circular or the surface fluids and your enzymes. For the, for the tissues to keep hydrated, you have lots of your saliva and then you have your GCF. And apart from that, you have the fluid content within the tissues itself, right? Now, apart from that, these fluids which uh, keep the tissues hydrated and they have a flushing effect or a lubricating property or a physical property with almost all the antibacterial enzymes. So, which can limit your pathogenic microbiota. And then your defense cells, that is your neutrophils, which are the first line of defense. Apart from that, your macrophages and monocytes both contribute to the mechanism of phagocytosis, that is cell eating or the process of endocytosis, wherein they have the capacity to engulf the pathogen and then release the enzymes within the neutrophil uh, granules and then cause about breakdown or the killing mechanism of your bacteria. Apart from that, your inflammatory reaction. You know that inflammatory reaction is always a protective mechanism. So, if an inflammatory reaction in the body, once started, is supposed to protect the body from the pathogenic microflora. What are the non? What are those were the non-specific? What is the specific pro protective mechanisms? The specific protective mechanism, as I told you, that they include two things. One is your the two basic components. One is your humoral immunity, and then the other one is a cell-mediated immunity. Now, both of these immunity, the the cells which are responsible for this to bring about this kind of immune response, are both synthesized or they are produced within the bone marrow from the stem cells or the hematopoietic stem cells. These hematopoietic stem cells are the one which give rise to your cell mediated immune cells that is your T lymphocytes and then the humoral mediated immune cells that is your B lymphocytes. Now how do you distinguish this specific immunity has certain features Now, the specific immunity can differentiate between one self and the bacteria meaning to say it detects the bacterial cell that is the pathogen or the antigen from the host cell. Now, your immunity means it shouldn't dis start destroying the host cells. It does, if, if it starts destroying the own cell of the body, then it will lead to autoimmunity. We don't want that. So this specific protective mechanism has the property to distinguish between the self and its enemy. And then apart from that, these defense contain elements which are specific to certain pathogens. For example, you say that uh, you, you the meaning to say that your body produces certain antibodies in order to direct against one particular pathogen. And this once already your antibody is produced against one, suppose, uh, the first insult that is your bacteria 
are entering the body and then your body has detected that there is a pathogen. So your body will start defending it by producing antibodies. Now these antibodies, the which were already produced during this time, if there is a second insult or the second infection, then the body will identify that particular pathogen that needs this particular antibody and it will send in that particular antibody for that particular antigen. That's what it says that the defenses contain elements specific against any given antigen. Apart from that, the system has a memory. Now, this uh, specific immunity has memory. It means it remembers that this pathogen had already infected the host before. So let me send this particular antibody in order to combat that particular antigen. Now let's go in detail about the role of epithelium. Now you're, we know that epithelium, the, the gingiva is covered by stratified squamous keratinizing uh, epithelium and then you also have non-keratinizing epithelia that is your junctional epithelium and sulcular epithelium. Now all these three epithelia have the property or they function as a physical barrier. They also have a mechanical, they maintain the mechanical integrity and then they have some signaling functions because they are tightly adherent to each other and apart from that some of them have the permeability there some are semi permeable epithelia and some are permeable epithelia so they have a diffusion process of exchange of ions now you see the role of junctional epithelium now this is the first line of or the first line of defense against your gram negative or the microbial invasions into the tissues you know your extent of your junctional epithelium exactly it starts the coronal limit of your junctional epithelium is right below the uh, sulcus your gingival sulcus right the coronal extent and the apical extent is just at your cemento enamel junction now this junctional epithelium is the only epithelial attachment that binds your tooth with that of your soft tissue now the internal and the external you know that the basal lamina is a structure which binds or which uh, basically bridges between your epithelium and connective tissue similarly your junctional epithelium also has a, uh, a basal lamina but here you have two different types of basal lamina that is your internal and your external basal lamina the internal basal lamina is the one which is facing towards your tooth structure you know that your tooth structure is also a connective tissue right it's a basically it's a hard kind of a connective tissue and your the connective tissue of the gingiva will be the soft one. So the external basal lamina of the junctional epithelium will be towards the connective tissue of the gingiva, whereas the internal basal lamina would be towards the tooth surface. Okay, now both of them unite at the apical portion of the junctional epithelium. Now these both act as a barrier against infective agents. So they don't allow anything to enter the connective tissue. Okay. Now this uh, junctional epithelium also has the property to release certain or it has some antibacterial peptides or antimicrobial peptides called as defensins. So they have the property of antimicrobial nature. So these defensins can combat the in, uh, infectious agents. Apart from that, they have the capacity to release certain lysosomal enzymes and then certain interleukins like interleukin 1, 6 and 8 which are the inflammatory mediators and apart from that, they also have the capacity to release your tumor necrosis factor alpha. What is the functions of saliva? Saliva has various functions. You have your lubricative function, you have your physical function, cleansing function, buffering action and then tooth, it maintains the tooth integrity and then antibacterial action. That is because of the various salivary components which contribute to the various functions of the saliva. If you see the lubrication is mainly because of the presence of glycoproteins and the mucoids which form a kind of a coating onto your soft tissues and your heart tissues and that is how it functions in the effect of lubrication the tissues and then it has a physical protection that is through the again coating caused by your glycoproteins and the mucoids and then the cleansing effect of the saliva is mainly because of the physical flow you know the composition or the, uh, the consistency of the saliva is neither too viscous neither too watery right so it has a mixed combination of both and then that will help in the so when there is a physical flow, there is a kind of a flushing effect which is created which will clear all the debris and the bacteria thus aiding in a self-cleansing mechanism of the tissues. And then you have the buffering function of the saliva. Now this buffering function is mainly brought, up, brought about by the composition or the presence of certain uh, electrolytes within the uh, uh, saliva that is your bicarbonates. Now your bicarbonates are once what the bicarbonates are present they give their tissues a more alkaline property therefore the acidic nature of the uh, fluid is decreased by the presence of this bicarbonates 
and then the tooth the, the next function is tooth integrity the tooth integrity is maintained because of the minerals and the glycoprotein pellicle apart from that your immunoglobulin a which also maintains the tooth integrity and it controls the bacterial accumulation or colonization now because of the presence of the glycoproteins and the mineral products which are present in the saliva there is always a constant remineralization and maturation process of the defective uh, areas in the tooth surfaces okay and apart from that the antibacterial function of saliva is mainly because of your lysozymes and your lactoperoxidase enzymes which have the antibacterial nature so they act against the bacteria and bring about their lysis so they break the uh, the basic mechanism of action is by breaking the bacterial cell wall also oxidation of your susceptible bacteria if you see the sulcular fluid now your sulcular fluid is also called as your gingival crevicular fluid it is a fluid which is seen pre or present within your gingival sulcus now what is this fluid now this fluid is not present always there's a controversy which is going on whether to call this fluid as a transudate or whether to call this fluid as an exudate so finally the net result of the controversy is that that you have to call it as transudate in a healthy condition because there is some kind of a fluid or uh, probably that inter cellular fluid which is released into the sulcus and that's why you can call in a healthy status you can call it as a transudate but then if you have an inflammatory state as the inflammation increases there is an increase in the gcf flow so now this inflammatory uh, fluid can be called as an exudate so when there is an inflammatory status you can call the gingival crevicular fluid as an exudate and when there is a healthy state you can call it as a transudate now the normal gcf flow is about 0.43 to 1.56 microliter and maximum it is in the proximal surface of your molars now basically this gingival crevicular fluid is nothing but the fluid which is which comes as a passage of your blood filtrate or the fluid from the blood stream through the tissues that exits into your gingival sulcus see the, let's go into detail about the composition of gingival crevicular fluid and this all this contains certain cellular elements it has some electrolytes it has organic compounds it has some metabolic and bacterial products and then it has some enzymes and enzyme inhibitors inhibitors now let's see what are the cellular elements the cellular elements of your gcf can be your leukocytes it can be your bacterial cells or your epithelial cells apart from that your electrolytes can be your sodium you have your potassium and your calcium and then the organic compounds include your carbohydrates proteins immunoglobulins complement components and your lipids and apart from that the metabolic and the bacterial in uh, products would be your lactic acid you have your prostaglandins you have your urea endotoxins which are released by the bacteria cytotoxic substances and your antibacterial enzymes or your antibacterial factors the enzymes and the enzyme inhibitors include your alkaline phosphatase acid phosphatase lysozymes pyrophosphatase tases and then your hyaluronidases and then proteolytic enzymes and lactic dehydrogenases and others how do you collect why you have to know the collection of this gcf now when you have to determine the pro uh, now the recent or advances in the diagnostic criteria of periodontal diseases would include collecting the gingival crevicular fluid and examining it to determine any of the compositions uh, the limit of the or the levels of the composition now we just discussed the composition of gcf right so if you can determine the levels of any of the uh, factors which are present in the composition of the gcf you can predict the disease progression of the of uh, disease progression of periodontal diseases that's why it becomes important to know what are the methods that you can use to collect these uh, this gingival crevicular fluid there are various methods the first method would be the filter paper strips you have your they are absorbent pa filter paper strips what do you do you can either have two methods of place using them you can place them into the sulcus or you can place them extra crevicular so either intra crevicular or extra crevicular extra crevicular meaning just place it at the entrance of the sulcus now that will absorb the whatever gcf fluid is present in the sulcus and that can be measured and gauged later in order to determine the amount of gcf okay now you should make sure that when you are placing the uh, absorbent filter paper strips into the sulcus if you are doing the intracravicular method you should make sure that you don't compress or you can you don't apply too much of pressure onto the 
uh, while placing it into the sulcus because this can cause a mechanical stimulation and leads to increased production of GCF or it can also cause bleeding and then it can contaminate the uh, GCF that is collected. So you don't get the exact value of the, G the normal value of the GCF that is present. You can also use twisted threads. You can use micro pipettes. You place a micro pipettes exactly in the entrance of the uh, sulcus, and then to the microcapillary action, you can collect the uh, GCF. And apart from that, there are some intraclavicular washings, and then other methods include paper, uh, plastic strips, and platinum loops. Now, how do you detect this? The ones that you have collected. Now, you have collected the gingival clavicular fluid. Now, how do you evaluate the amount of fluid that you have collected? The first method would be direct viewing and staining. What do you do? For example, you take your pe uh, absorbent paper strips and then you stain it with something called as a ninhydrin of about aqueous uh, alcoholic solution of 0.2% ninhydrin, which turns, which makes the filter paper strip wherever the GCF is collected into blue or purple color. And then the stained area is measured with either a transparent scale or you can use a vernier calipers or a calibrated magnifying glass. And then or else you can weigh the strips that you have collected the pre pre uh, uh, before the collection of GCF what is the weight of the strips and after the collection of GCF what would be the weight and then you subtract each other or else the latest devices which are used for qualitative uh, measurement of uh, sorry quantitative assessment of GCF would be a periotron Now you have various uh, models of periotron starting from periotron 8000 6000 and the latest one is periotron 8000 then you have uh, the next uh, slide shows the permeability and the junction of the sulcular and the junctional epithelium. Now, how is this fluid come? What is the mechanism for the passage of this fluid from the junctional epithelium of the sulcular epithelium into the gingival sulcus? Now, basically, they say it is through the intercellular junctions or the intercellular movements of the molecules that the uh, GCF is uh, shown. Now, it is not that it is breaking the or uh, it's not traversing the cell membranes. Basically, the intercellular fluid is exiting out of your, uh, into the gingival sulcus. That is a mechanism of penetration of the fluid. If you see what is the clinical significance, as I told you, the first significance of knowing the gingival clavicular fluid is that you can determine the state of health of the tissues, okay, whether, the, it, it, uh, whether you, it is in the state of disease or uh, health. And then, uh, the significance of knowing the gingival clavicular fluid, the one most important is drugs in the GCF. Now, if you can incorporate certain drugs like tetracyclines, they show an excessive concentration of the drug within the gingival clavicular fluid, almost about 7 to 10 times. Now, if this drug is given, for example, you give as a local drug delivery, you place some local drug delivery agent, that is your tetracycline, into the periodontal pocket. Okay, now this will start slowly releasing the drug and it can maintain the concentration of the drug within the GCF so that this antibacterial property of the tetracycline can be incorporated into the tissues and it can show its effect for a very prolonged period of time. So that can be utilized with this property of tetracycline showing increased concentration in the gingival clavicular fluid. Now, what is the um, clinical significance of the influence of mechanical stimuli? Now, you, you, the minute the more and more amount of inflammatory process is there, there is an increase in the production of GCF flow. Okay, that would be one of the important signs. Then, parodontal therapy and gingival fluid. Now, if you can, if you are able to maintain or if you are able to control the periodontal diseases, the GCF flow automatically reduces. You know that during the inflammatory status, the GCF flow increases. And that completes your defense mechanism of ginger. Thank you.